Ladies and gentlemen, expect the unexpected. And as you have seen the movie, and I really personally like this movie, I like this slide. Because it shows to me everything that we have to do in business. We can have some fun, but we have to stay afloat. We have to have some certain skills, and I'm coming to that later today, which I call the balance. If we have this, we have the skills and we have the focus. We will be able to ride any wave. A wave like this is run by the world champion Sebastian Steudner, who happens to be a German living in Honolulu, Hawaii. In 2009, he rode the biggest wave ever of 30 meters plus. To stay afloat of such a big, massive energy of water, of what is behind you, needs a certain set of skill. And that's something we look into how to expect this unexpected and look into the systematics that could be behind such a theme to stay afloat and to succeed. We look into shaky economics, political change. We look into population growth and urbanization. We look into natural resources getting shorter in supply and global warming. And I'm very glad that we have so many other speakers this morning <coughs> that will touch on a similar subject in a similar direction with a different focus. So please allow me to share my view, my focus on this subject with you this morning. And I hope we can have some discussion further on later in the discussion. We all know, latest since Greece went into debt, that uh, public debt is something that's not very good. And as we can see here, this is not really up to date, it's one, two years old. Nevertheless, Greece, Italy, Japan, Ireland, and Ireland lately has been downgraded, which has dramatic results on every people living in Ireland. I don't just put on Ireland, it's all over all developed worlds that have what I call the trap. High indebtedness, high interest rates will lead to high tax, which leads, in consequence, high debt service. Somebody has to pay the bill at the end of the day, which limits further growth. Just the opposite. If everybody looks back 20 years ago, we had a sick man at the Bosporus, we had a sick man in Latin America. Just the opposite. If you look just at the BRIC, Brazil, Russia, and the China countries, their public debt is going down to levels below 20 in Brazil. I just wrote an article a few days ago, it's even going down further for the next few years, to be expected. So what will that mean to us? Looking on the global scale, the growth will slow in the developed world, or has already slowed down. So we have to look into what does it mean to us, in our industry, if this slow growth will continue. Because Goldman Sachs has been very good in creating these names, BRIC, Brazil, Russia, India, China. But for those who are not yet so familiar with the new term, it's called the New 11. N11, which starts with Mexico, it's not complete up here, Nigeria, Egypt, and I mentioned yesterday, somebody from Egypt, I crossed the say, I will mention Egypt today, so feel free, welcome. In the club, uh, Turkey, with all the Tur Turkish countries, and down to Philippines, Indonesia, which is, according to Goldman Sachs' latest study, the new 11, which will have tremendous growth potential for the next years to come. Looking back in history, those who know me already, I like to look also back in history to get some some, some, some strategies for the, f for the future. What did we have a few hundred years ago? The world order was clearly colonial power. Spain, France, Portu uh, Portugal. I didn't put the Portuguese flag, sorry guys, but I uh, didn't have so much time, some space up here. So I ended up with the British. What was their power that were these colonial powers? It was the Armada. As of today, let's call it the aircraft carrier. Everybody who has an aircraft carrier can at any place on this earth, access with his weapon, which means power. So we had this world order until end of Second World War. What happened after the Second World War? The Americans became, of course, Russia was a part of it between, let's, let's put aside the Cold War, and the European Union, they became the unilateral power, more the Americans than the European, so please allow me this small uh, this diversion. What will be the future, and is already the coming future, if you look at the latest, who built the latest uh, aircraft carrier? It's the Chinese, it's the Indian. 
So this new world order will be a multipolar world. Will it become peaceful? I doubt. But I'm not a prophet. So something that carry along is there is some risk in that development. And this risk is also driven by population growth, which we know, and this is a latest study. My son Jacob has done it for me, United Nations. He's, that's not him, right? He's over here. Uh, till the year 2050, the world growth population will peak. And we can clearly see where is the growth population. It's Asia and Africa. The developed worlds will stay flat. And all this immigration discussion, I'm very sad to hear last week we had an, immigration, uh, sorry, an election here in Austria, which was one subject, immigration, not integration, immigration. And how can a developed world without new brain from outside be more competitive? I doubt. The Americans, Canadians and Australians are doing a much better job by attracting foreign talents, the real high talents. Europe is a little bit going down in that direction, at least to my view. Urbanization. And if you look at China, from now, China will have about 800 million people in cities. India, if you go to India, there's one construction site everywhere, so it will go urbanization. What that means? Steel, cement, infrastructure, food. Now you can grow your rice and your, on your patty, you can grow a small chicken and have your own egg. You hardly can do that in uh, your own backyard in New Delhi. Even though some politicians, I heard, have some great idea to grow vegetables on the balcony or have an egg on the balcony, something like that. But maybe not for everybody's taste. What also happens with the growth of the world population, we have a growth in income. Whereas the aggregated growth development is clearly in the developing countries. The developed world will not have much real net income growth. If you look at Germany, they just settled the, because of unionized bargaining, they just settled for the steel industry. Maybe the net uh, increase of salary, half a percent, one percent. A study showed in the developed countries the last 10 years, real income minus, income minus inflation, real income has not really grown strong. We have now a huge factor in Brazil, and sorry Brazilian guys, we all know it, there is a very strong bargaining over there, net increase on sale, sales, uh, sorry, income on salary, 4 to 5 percent. And that's what it means here. So there's more money in the pocket in the developing world than in the developed world to spend on new toys. And we all know, everybody in this room knows, with growing income, the meat and uh, animal protein uh, gro uh, consumption is growing. This is a rubber bank from 1995 to 25. <coughs> and it will grow further. So that's the good message in here, that's the good news. Everybody in that industry, as we all are, in the food and feed industry, we have some markets to serve, but there's some constraint. And everybody was watching the corn lately, and the soybean prices, don't worry, they're still cheap. They will go up further. And whatever we have been realizing, 207, 208, on a peak on wheat, on corn, it's maybe not the last peak we have seen. So we all have to keep in mind that resources in feed and food, especially in grains, is getting scarier because there's a bigger demand. That means, what I said, natural resources of short supply. An average American uses 360 kilograms paper a day, uh, sorry, a year, 340 kilos paper. If everybody in China is doing the same, times 1.3 billion, you can imagine how many trees you need for that paper? It's a lot. So, without giving you a clear picture on how much it is, let's jump to the vehicles. Everybody know China has taken over America for the first time ever as the single largest vehicle car sales market, 12 million cars being sold. If every Chinese has the same amount of cars that the average American has, that means about 80 million sales car sold per year in China. That would be the single market ever of anything. 
And especially with the Tata, my Indian friends, 2,500 US dollars is yours. It's small, it's cute, it can go everywhere in New Delhi and in Bombay, because the roads have so many ways to go around. So, it's a perfect car. But what does it mean, more, road, more cars on the road? So, car sales will go up, and vehicles go up in this coming. And there was an interesting comment I wrote once in the Financial Times, and the guy said simply, these developing countries cannot consume the same way as we did. Sounds great, right? But who follow? How can you tell a Chinese, an Indian, a Bangladeshi, whatever, a Brazilian, not to have a car while you have two in your porch? He will not listen. He says, stupid you. I also want to have two cars. End of story. So that means there's a lot of pressure in the regulatory, in the technical, to, to, to come across this demand. Because the demand is there. The question is, how do we deal with it? How do we create probably a chance out of it? Of course, they all need oil and energy. And energy is a very interesting subject. Because many people say, uh, save energy, great. Make uh, renewable energy, great. But with this demand, which is from here to here, estimated about 20 thousand terawatt hours. A terawatt is megawatt, gigawatt, terawatt. It's a lot. For the next 20, 30 years, we need to fill energy. And now it comes. Electrical cars are very sexy. They're very environmental friendly, as long as you have an environmental friendly electricity. But most times the electricity comes from the coal power plant. So where is now the real benefit? It's probably rather to have ethanol as they do in Brazil or something else. So it's not an easy answer. I'm not here to answer it, but just to highlight it to you. This 20,000 terawatt hours is an equivalent to 3,409 nuclear power plants, just to get the feeling of the size. Of course, you can say, we put some coal plants, we put some hydro plants, we put some wind power, we put something else, fine. That's the equivalent you have to meet if this happens to be true. So, with all this energy consumption, I think everybody is now clear, knows something is around. And let's touch shortly on this global warming. Financial Times, New York, flooding, heat waves, drought, the worst summer of the year. Capital was filled up with snow, and then the summer was hot. And everybody says, no, there is no, no climate change, it's just coincidental. Let's look into it. Water supply, agriculture, ecosystems will be affected. That's what New York Times said. We also, in our industry, do a little bit of this, uh, emitting some of the carbon gases, that's all. So probably that's the future. Every cow in New Zealand and Australia will have a tank, and we can sell the methane to the biogas plants. Would be an interesting business model. It's just a question how you keep those uh, cows afloat with all these tanks around it. Uh, let's look into greenhouse from this study from Fifana. Just lately came in 13 percent, and that's an interesting one. 13 percent of all greenhouse emitted from, anthro from, from agriculture livestock, 18 total, 13. Uh, extensive animal husbandry, extensive grazing animals. And five is intensive animal. So if it ever it will come, Australia has been discussing the project already, they have a carbon tax on your animals. The only solution is intensify, get it off from the grass, which is, I agree, in New Zealand, Australia, not an easy thing. Probably production will shift somewhere else, other than those extensive countries. Something to feed for thought. I just came across the very interesting book from Thomas Friedman, who wrote the book 1995, The World is Flat. And now I came up with a later book, which is called Hot, Flat, and Crowded. So let's look into what he citation did. And one of the interesting citations I found was this guy from Sierra Club called Carl Pope. He postulated the term relative consumption rate 
per capita. Relative consumption rate per capita. That means a summary of everything you consume, from electricity, from the steel, from the plastic bag, from the bio waste you, you, you produce, everything. Everything you consume as a consumer, not only the paper, everything. And he made a theory out of it calling the relative consumption rates per capita, and that's an interesting one. He has, here we can see the gross, it's one example. I, did, I took this table because it fits very nicely. Consumption means everything, right? Here we look into energy consumption per capita. Put it simply in terms, but it shows what the concept says. The lowest bottom is two. When you are at the very poor early stage, sorry to say, this name says Ethiopia, I could put any other developing country who is on that stage, has the factor of two. They consume two units of water, of electricity, they have one bulb, they have no air condition, they have no car, they walk to the school, they have no whatever, whatever, and maybe not even electricity during the night. Now, the top of the range is here, 30 times more. So what it does, once you go up the line, very interesting, watch. When you go up the line, in your development, Argentina, Greece, da 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 da, -da your consumption increases 33 times. It doesn't go like this, it goes multiplication, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. Which means, these guys, if, he, if these guys increase from here to here, and they have a 1 billion people under their wing, the amount which they consume is tremendous. So, let's look into it. There is one, roughly, I put very simple because that really helps to explain the concept. There's totally, at this point of time, one billion people who are developed, so to say, who are consumed on a very high level at 32, the highest level possible. Okay. There's about 5.5 billion, sorry, that should be billion, are you on this earth who put it on the average scale of uh, 16, so it makes this one 88, the total sum of 120. If this world goes up, as we expect, 2050 to 3 million, 3 billion, 3 billion developed people living in developed worlds, another 6.5 living in this average world as we have dem demanded it economically before, it almost doubles in these next 40 years on everything they consume. It doesn't just gradually go up from let's say, 6 million billion to 9 billion, right? That would be simple. This is about 20, 30 percent. No. Consumption rate, according to this theory, will at least, this is very conservative, double. In the past, with 5.5, 4.5 billion people, we have an easy solution. We have an easy solution. If you need energy, you drill a hole. If you need paper, you cut a tree, right? If you need steel, you build a new mine. But is this still really the case? Can we continue with this one? Is this really something? Something? Sorry, gentlemen. Uh, we are close to society here. And you're not really properly dressed, I would say. Hey, what's going on here? Who invited this guy? Who did? Come on. Mr. Valuliso. Sorry. My goodness, I couldn't have done better. <laughs> Mr. Valuliso. Hmm? Okay, interesting, yeah? Okay. So let's go back because he stole my show, right? He did, huh? 
Bye bye. Bye bye. Coffee is downstairs, right? Okay. See you downstairs. Ah, okay, okay. So if we need energy, we drill a hole. We need paper, we cut a tree. We need more steel for our cars. We need the, oh, sorry, we make a new mine. That doesn't work anymore when you go back on the relative consumption rate. Because it's not the linear increase, it's a potential increase. It doubles, it triples in the next 40 years. So, and I'm not here to tell you what's the solution. Sorry, I can't give you a solution on that question. Because there are other guys who are doing better, and this is only one possible way. The cradle-to-cradle -cradle concept developed by Bungard and McDonough, 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 which is very simple. The theory is simple, practice not always easy. Recycle everything, right? If we take every car we have put on the road back and make a new car out of it with the same steel, same everything, then you don't need a new mine. If you have the energy from solar in your electric car, you don't need anything to recycle. I do anything you put in your hole. It's just that concept. I leave it up to you to, to read more about it, to think more about it. I'm, my intention is here to show what's going on on the larger scale. And large scale always to me means long-term view. Because for the next two years, it's easy answer. For the next 40 years, might not be so easy. That's just one way. Now when we talk about this sustainable thing, there's always an interesting observation, even among friends. You can find out those guys who say, we had it all before, and it will go away. That's the easy way out, right? Say, why? What the heck about it? We will go away. Oh, don't talk about it. There are the other people who say, hold well, on. If it's two centigrade more warmer in Norway, they will even enjoy it because they have a warmer summer. So what does really two or three centigrade more Warm, more temperature in this globe mean? Nothing really, right? Very small. But when your child has a temperature of three above average, you're going to see the doctor. I would guess so. Just another thought. If you look at the risk management, how many globes, how many worlds we have? Only one. If we miss that one, then we're in trouble. The question is, how many times we can crash an airline. One times, two times, just to find out it's still sexy, it works. These guys were lucky, right? They made it. Most of them never made it because they crashed once. So, in simple terms, we look at something very fragile and we should handle it with care. And I hope this guy meant something about this one, yeah? Not so? So, we ride this wave, we have all this pressure from the back, and now it comes to the concept I would like to share with you, which we have developed over the time. And that's something I feel in our organization, or I view, I look, I try to get an organization that's in this way balanced. Balance is the one thing that keeps this guy on the board. And balance is created with your staff in your family. This is uh, Freud, whatever the others uh, you have. Every people personality is defined by extroverted or introverted. Still got time. Task result or human. Put it this very basic. And I would like to keep it basic and simple, but to understand or to show the concept. There are people who are extroverted, but very task oriented. We call them the tiger. That's from Mrs. Deubler. And this is very illustrative. What is this guy doing? Powerful, fearful, he, he decides on tasks, and he is extroverted, he's outspoken. That's the other type of people who is outspoken, but very human and social and easy talking, easy going. It's the dolphin. Call it the dolphin. Because he's human oriented, he or she, sorry. If somebody is introverted but human oriented, it's the elephant. Those people who never forget, if they have 20 years ago, you have stolen them a, sugar, a chocolate in, in the bar from their school bag, they will remember 20 years later. And the bee or the ant is the ones that work day and night, everything to order, the very typical and the best you can have in your company as an accountant is a bee. I never would like to have a dolphin as my accountant, to be sure or to be honest. So what it means? It's not something to say, this is good, this is bad. No. 
Something I'm going to show you, we need everyone in an organization, but we need them in a certain balance. Because in every, and now let me be on the organization level, every company is driven by two forces, by two major forces. The one is the inside, production, procurement, everything, uh, accounting, everything which is internally making a proper arrangement that everything is to order, everything is to plan, nothing is unexpected. Sorry, and then we get these guys who see the customer. And they come back and say, sorry guys, your production plan, I don't care, I need it tomorrow. And the production guy said, not with me, crazy guy, I have my plan three days of three weeks or three months, whatever. And that, I think you can think now of your organization, is the same everywhere. We have these two worlds, the inside and the outside. And we have to have it. Now, the question in an organization, the $100,000 question in an organization is, if there's no arrangement, no agreement between these two guys, right? Direction. Let's say there's an order coming in urgent, production says no. So now you go to the boss, say, hey boss, I have this beautiful order, I can sell so much, but the guy doesn't produce it. Now comes the question, who in this organization usually is right and who is wrong? And you can think of yourself in organization thinking, there's always the same. The boss say, you're going to produce it, so then this guy is right. Or the boss says, you are right and you are wrong, that means sales is always right, production is always wrong. And what happens if that pattern is existing? It's a complete demotivation of the other side. If they're always the ones who are wrong, the others always right, then you have a problem. So, what's now the solution out of it? Here we can see he is always right, he or she. The other organization, he or she is always right, right? That's what I said. So, as I said, we have to look for some balance. And I found an interesting piece in history, by chance in Chinese history, which is very clearly illustrating this dilemma. China, before the year 1421, was the most powerful nation on earth. They had tribute paying from Somalia to, to from Japan. They were all paying tribute to China because China was not only technology far advanced of any other nation at earth at that time. They had everything from porcelain for the compass, this is the Chinese compass, to the silk, everything was made in China. The rest was just buying from China. I think that sounds familiar. So, at that year, there was an emperor, Zhongli, second from the Ming Dynasty. And this emperor was the most powerful emperor of that time, the most powerful ruler on earth. Zhongli, he commanded an army of more than one million soldiers, more than one million soldiers at any time. King Richard in England had 12,000, just as a comparison. He, built, he rebuilt the Great Wall, and he was the one who brought Beijing to the new capital from Nanjing. He was the one who built the Forbidden City. If you go to Beijing today, you're definitely going to see this uh, tr treasure of, of, of history. And this guy built it ruthless. He cut all the teak trees in China and Vietnam and wherever he could get it just to build his dream city. He didn't care of anything else other than his fulfillment. He was really a ruthless warrior. And as you can imagine, he was definitely a tiger. And this is his most important uh, admiral, Zhang He who was seven times, seven times sent out with a fleet of ships, the largest fleet ever available to explore the world and find new states who can pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. In 1421, the Forbidden City was opened and 20,000 dignitaries from all over the world, from Japan down to Somalia, India and all the other places, were in Beijing at that celebration 
for the opening of the Forbidden City, 20,000 dignitaries. John Hill took 212 ships to bring them back and explore the world even further. And as we know of today, he explored with three separate expeditions the whole world to Greenland, to America, to, Latin, to, to, to uh, further down Argentina, and everywhere Australia was explored and known to the Chinese. So, Zhong Li was a clear warrior. The opposite of a warrior is the Mandarin. Oops, sorry. Is the Mandarin. The Mandarin in China, and China in this way is very interesting, but then let's talk about Chinese history. As a Chinese, you can, by education, come up to the highest level of officer by just passing the exam. You become a minister from a peasant. No barrier as long as you pass the exam. There was no further landlords, there was no dukes in between. You could make it up to the top. And in every Chinese history, there was always the warriors on the one side and the mandarins doing the administration. So, Zhongli was a warrior. And now, 1423, he passed away, unfortunately, or quick. And his son, Zhongli, was raised by the mandarins on the court of Beijing. Because the mandarins were very uh, jealous because they've always been neglected very much neglected by the warrior uh, Zhong Li. He even sent his finance minister to jail because he didn't want to pay him for a war he was going to, to rule. So, you can imagine, the Mandarins been very, very tricky and they educated the son as a Mandarin. So what happened is, under the rule of the son, the whole country turned from being a warrior state to the this side, Mandarin. And what is called now in theory, that's my theory, when you come from one extreme to the other, then you go back to the other, and you go back to the other, this what's called oscillation. How should your staff, how should your soldiers, how should your officers know what's really going on now, what subject? They don't know. They just say, ah, don't know, do nothing. So at the end, you lose everything. And that happened to China after this change of rule, change of law on this oscillation. China became closed. The Mandarin said, we don't need all this outside. We just stay ourselves. We're so happy. We have everything. Why ask the world? So, based on that historical example, think of your own organization. Where do I stand? Am I a warrior? Am I a Mandarin? Am I in between? How do I find out if I want to know how is my coming back balance? Very easy. You take every staff you have, let's say key staff management, whatever you want, or you take your family and find out where is the majority of my staff? Are they warriors? Are they men? Sorry, are they, uh, uh, are they, are they tigers? Or are they bees or whatever? Are they in between? You can find out there's some ways of doing that. So, and then you find out where is my organization standing. Another very interesting sign, there's also something you can quite, when you come to a company, when you come to an organization, sooner or later you will find out who is giving the direction, who makes the last, last decisions when it's something tricky. Is it this side or is it this side? Answering the question, this guy likes to take risk, right? No doubt, risk is fun. No, no risk, no fun. These guys are just the opposite. No risk at all. Everything has to be secured, orders. If in the meeting somebody asks you, do we have an insurance? Do we know what we do? What do we do when something goes wrong? Da -da -da. He might be one of this side, right? So, and I can prove to you in a very easy, and that's in this box. I can prove to you on a very plastic example how this can lead to downturn or upturn. The British Empire probably was the most powerful, and still is because everybody speaks English in this room, right? We don't speak French, we don't speak Italian, Spanish, whatever, not Chinese. So that means there is some, some, uh, some influence from this uh, empire. It was the most important, the most powerful empire at that time on Earth. It still went down. Why? 
now I can share with you something. And it's this thing called extension cord. You might find it funny, right? I also find it interesting. Because if you look at this uh, extension cord, oops, sorry. You plug it in, it's fused, and it says security. It comes in this extension, it's fused, and has a switch, and has a fuse again. So, before you plug it to your computer, you have five safety devices. Five safety devices just to make sure that the electricity comes from here to the computer. Is it necessary? And the other thing, if you ever have tried to open this with your own two hands, you need a third hand. I tried many times, I never managed. So, let's put it this side. Sorry. There's another way of doing it, right? Just straight in. The warrior way, right? Easy, what's, what, does, what is a fuse, what is a switch? I really wouldn't advise that either. But, there's some clever guys came up with a solution which is this, it cannot be open, it's sealed, it has all the security devices, safety devices, and it's doing the same thing, plugging my computer. So, that's why my theory says, if you think like this, you have a problem when this becomes your systemic nature. If you think like this, you better be dead sooner or later, so be careful. Don't follow this, right? I have another example, and I was getting permission for that one from our American team, because I don't want to be negative, I just want to highlight to you on a very simple example what risk aversion can lead to. And what too much risk can lead to, we have shown on this already. So, the American car industry, when I was a boy, I dreamed of one thing. It was called Ford Mustang. It was absolutely the car I wanted to have. Luckily, I never got one, because it was very bumpy. Anyway, I loved it. Everybody loved American cars at that time, right? And why GM, at the end, went down, if everybody liked it? Very simple. Because in America, you have this, what's called speed limits. Safety restrictions. For safe driving, they used to have 55 miles, then they go down to 65 miles, and if you drive 68 miles in Texas, you'll be fined and have to go for retraining. Now, some states have 75 miles, but still have a speed limit. Risk adversion, control your risk. What will happen? The industry standards follow exactly your risk profile. Making a car which is safe up to 55. If you drive this car 90, you're going to be most probably under some risk uh, that you don't want to be. What did the Germans do? or the Europeans, but Germany in particular. The German car industry is booming. Everybody in Asia wants to have a BMW or Mercedes or whatever. And I'm going to share with you why this is the case. Because in Germany, we got the Autobahn. Autobahn, which has no speed limit. You can go over there in Munich and drive 280, and you will not be fined if you can. If you will not be fined by the, by, the, by the police, as long as you are on the Autobahn. What means? Risk is fun, but you have to control it. What means to me, and then I'm ending my theory, and it's only my theory, the German cars are that sexy to everybody because you know these guys can drive 240 even though you never do it. But you can do it safe. And that's what I mean by getting a balance and still being sexy. That's more or less what I have brought to you. I'm exactly ending. How come that? is what's your best organizational fit, and it's just something I would like to offer you, share with you, what we have developed in-house for our own view of organizational fitness. In order to stay afloat, in order to stay ahead, and in order to make use of the power that pushes you forward, with this power, stay one thing, stay balanced. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.